All right, hello and uh, welcome everyone. I apologize for being um, uh, 10 minutes late uh, today. It, it, it was um, due to uh, my first moment of sheer uh, terror as a parent. Um, right before I was about to go in and stream, I was like, oh, let me say goodnight to the baby. Uh, he goes to bed at seven, so. Um, and we couldn't find him like anywhere. And, you know, we're starting to like, like we're looking around and we're calling him and he's not responding and we don't he hear him. And we're like checking everywhere and upstairs. And then we're like, did he get outside? No, all the doors are locked. Like, you know, and we have like neighbors with pools. So we're wondering like, Oh my gosh, did he like get out? And, um, frantically searching the house and, uh, and we found, we found him. He was hiding behind the TV stand, um, and he'd gotten hold of the Switch. We have a Nintendo Switch. He had gotten it, pulled it off his cradle, and was hiding behind the TV stand because he's not. We don't give him video games. <laughs> um, he's not allowed to to have those. He's two years old, and uh, and he had taken the Switch and was hiding behind the TV and just sitting with his lap it, with it in his lap, pushing buttons. Like it's not like he can play anything. It was just the forbidden thing, and oh my gosh, it was it was just it was terrifying. And then we found him, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you sneaky little turd, because like he could hear us and everything, but he knew to be quiet because once we found him, we take away his thing. So, anyways, um, we found him. He's fine. The switch is fine. Um, but I'm ten minutes late to streaming. So, um, all's well that ends well. I apologize for being late. Um, and I'm here and ready to, uh, to answer any and all questions. <laughs> okay, thank you for your, um, concerned, uh, emoji. Um, that was exactly what I was doing on the inside in addition to like the crying and f freaking out emoji. Um, but all's well that ends well. Hey dude. What's going down? <laughs> yeah. so bummed for Halloween and it's on a Saturday this year which is awesome see here. So, um, all right, yes, and we can hit all of those problems. So, um, so here's, here's the deal. 
even though so so we 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 made so okay so here's change in enthalpy for a reaction is equal to the change in energy of a reaction divided by the moles, right? Of a limiting reactant. We know that change, the change in energy for a reaction is equal to the change in thermal energy plus the change in energy due to work. Um, and this is where, and we, we uh, derived this in class, because usually, usually re for, um, for most reactions, actually I should change this. So for most reactions, there's no change in volume. You have a constant volume. And if you have a constant volume, if your change in volume is zero, that means the change in work is zero. So for most reactions, the change in energy is equal just to the change in therm the change in energy for a reaction is equal to the change in thermal energy and that's what allowed us to write and and this is the equation that i wrote in class that the change in energy for a reaction is equal to the change in thermal en thermal energy divided by the moles of limiting reactant but this is only true only the case when you experience no change in volume. So um, for a more complex system where the volume is changing, then the change in enthalpy, it would include that energy that was um, lost or gained through work in addition to the energy lost or gained through thermal energy. Um, so, so it's totally both end. Enthalpy, the change in enthalpy for a reaction is the total energy change of that reaction divided by the moles of limiting reagent. That being said, almost all of the time, again, unless you're doing like gas phase chemistry or, or studying some very specific systems where there is a change in volume, almost always there's no change in volume. And when there's no change in volume, the energy change for a reaction is just equal to the change in thermal energy. So Kate, that's why we, um, wrote that, but it absolutely can, does relate to all energy changes. It's just, there's almost never any energy transferred through work. Ah. Okay, hang on one second. Ludwig, um, that, um, Kate, I'm so glad, um, Ludwig, that type of problem deals with, um, something called, here, let me.
right, Kate, I am currently pulling up my um, textbook. Um, once I have it active, then we'll start chopping down those problems. Gotcha. Oh, okay, Ludwig, you are on. Ludwig, you are in, I, I didn't realize that you're in uh, Professor Mahoney's lecture, which means you totally do need to worry about it. All right, so so Ludwig, I'm gonna write yours up really quick, cause um, because uh, cause it's gonna be it's gonna be fast. Um, no, 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 not Ludwig, not at all, totally not at all. Um, and actually, I'm gonna do yours. Kate's are probably gonna take a little while, um, to to knock all those out. So here's the thing, um. So the Debroigi, which it's spelled Debrogli, um, wavelength has to do with um, particle wave uncertainty. And um, this is something that we've touched on. We've, we've kind of discussed this conceptually, how um, everything can be described as a particle or a wave. And the more mass something has, the more particle-like it can be. It's it, how uh, its behavior fits particle. And if it's has a smaller mass, its behavior is more wave-like. Well, um, the de Broglie wavelength is something you can use to calculate what the wavelength of a particle would be, and it's based on its mass. So, so here's the equation. It's um, lambda, the wavelength, is equal to Planck's constant divided by mass and frequency um oh wait hang on no, no 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 that's not frequency um and velocity all right so um <laughs> kate i so appreciate you being um flexible um so h Is Planck's constant? It's six point six two six times ten to the negative thirty fourth um, joules times seconds. Um, the mass, or m, is the mass um, of an object. And um, V is velocity.
So V is the velocity. Um, in other words, speed. So it's how fast something's going. Um, something that you should know. Let me look this up. Um, so something you should know, um, and it's only important, well, not only important, but it is important in this problem, is the energy unit joule. has a conversion factor that's important. One joule is equal to one um, kilogram times meter squared over second squared. All right? Um, and this becomes important when you solve problems like this. So for example, Um, for example, Ludwig, in the problem that you just asked, um, the mass of the car was 3,000 um, pounds. And let's see where did it go. 3,000 pounds. And the velocity of the car was 55 miles per hour, all right? Um, but because the energy unit for joules, um, we're gonna need kilograms in order to cancel it, so we gotta convert pounds to kilograms. In addition, you'll notice that our time unit for our velocity is hour, but for joules, it's seconds, so we gotta convert hours to seconds, and the, uh, distance length unit is meters and here it's miles so we're gonna have to do a couple conversions here um, let's see so we need to get pounds to kilograms all right and the unit conversion here is one pound is point four five four kilograms. All right, so let's see. So we got three thousand times point four five four. is 1,362 kilograms. I'm not sure how many sig figs were in this original problem, so I'm just gonna do this without rounding, because um, I don't know if that's 3,000 with one sig fig or what the deal is. Or right, we gotta do a couple unit conversions here on this miles per hour situation. I'm just gonna rewrite it. So first off, we gotta convert hours to seconds. So one hour has 60 minutes. One minute has 60 seconds. So hours and minutes cancel. Finally, um, we gotta convert from uh, miles to meters. So, um, one mile is 1.61 kilometers and then one kilometer is 1,000 
meters. All right, so now we go 55 divided by 60 divided by 60 times 1.61 times 1,000. So this velocity is uh, 24.6 meters per second. All right, now you'll notice that in our original problem, we have, we know Planck's constant, we know our mass, we know our velocity, all of them in the right unit, so we can calculate our de Broglie, de Broglie wavelength. So lambda um, is equal to h over mass times speed, so we got 6.626 from sin to the negative 34th. I'm oh, sorry, and this is joules seconds, but I'm gonna write joules in its uh, in its other form, kilogram meter squared over second squared times seconds over, let's see, our mass we converted, 1362 kilograms times our velocity, which is 24.6 meters per second. And you'll notice that kilograms, cancel kilograms, our meters down here cancels one of our two meters, leaving one meter behind. And then this second squared in the denominator cancels with this seconds and this seconds. So we're left with meters, which is good. We're finding a wavelength. Um, now we punch it in 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th divided by 1362 divided by 24.6. Um, so our wavelength is 1.98 times 10. Let's see. 10 to the negative 38th meters. That is the wavelength of a uh, 3,000 pound car traveling at 55 miles an hour. So Ludwig, that is how you tackle that situation. All right, Sammy, thank you for being patient. Let me see, some of the problems in Exodus 4, oh, you're asked to assign oxidation numbers, then once you had the oxidation numbers to determine the substance being oxidized and reduced. Um, Ah, okay, yes, Sammy, th and thank you for being patient. Ludwig, you are totally welcome. Um, Sammy, yes, um, when those problems... That is 100% correct. They are just asking for the element. That is being oxidized.
right, let's see. Okay, Kate, let me... Sorry, I'm trying to find your um, original... There we go. Chapter 6. Starting with problem 71. Let's see. All right. So in this problem, um, we're told that 1.5 grams of fuel burns um, under conditions of constant pressure and then again under conditions of constant volume. In the measurement A, the reaction produces... Ah. Okay. So it burns under A... constant pressure and B constant volume um, in measurement A the reaction produces 25 um, or our hang on we actually don't know which one is A and B we're, we're given that um, Put these down here. For A, uh, the reaction produces 25.9 kilojoules of heat. And for B, it produces 23.3 kilojoules of heat. And the reason why I'm putting negative signs is because energy is produced. Which measurement A or B corresponds to conditions of constant pressure, which corresponds to constant volume? Explain. All right, now here's the dead giveaway. Under constant volume, constant volume means change in volume is zero, which means that the energy transferred through work is also zero. So in this instance, under constant volume, the energy of the reaction, which we know change in energy is thermal plus work, just equals zero. Yes, or all the, it's not that all the work is done through Q, no work is done. All the energy is transferred, released through Q. So, with this one, because the thing is, this is the same reaction. So, the same amount of energy for A and B here's the thing, because you're using the same fuel, you're burning the same fuel, which means you're doing the same reaction. That means that the change in energy for A is equal to the change in energy in B. It's the same reaction. The constant volume situation, all of the energy is thermal. Whereas the constant pressure situation, it can be thermal and work. So when I look at these two, This is larger because all the energy is transferred th 
through work. All right, that's why that's larger. The same amount of energy is released both times, but this one has a larger Q because no energy is transferred. Oh, sorry, I said through work. It's the opposite, through, or it's transferred, I should say, thermally. All energy is transferred thermally, none through work. Yes, through Q, yes, that is, that is exactly what I mean. So this one is constant volume. And we would say that V would be the constant pressure. <laughs> totally. All right, so that is um, 71, not too shabby. Let's take a look at 72. Number 72, in order to obtain the largest possible amount of heat from a chemical reaction in which there's a large increase in the number of moles of gas, largest possible amount of heat, um, should you carry out the reaction under conditions of constant volume or constant pressure? All right, they're asking, how we can get the largest possible value for heat, which is Q. Should we pick constant pressure or constant volume? Whoa. And we've already seen why constant volume is the move. Yep, exactly. Kate, that is exactly correct. This is exactly correct, because if you pick constant volume, nothing is transferred through work. All of it is going to be funneled through thermal pathways. So that is how you get the maximum value for Q. Yeah, but the thing is, it's actually a distraction in this problem. Um, you actually don't need to know the moles. They're just throwing it in there to confuse you and make you wonder, like, oh, what's going on? Because... Um, anytime you want to maximize heat, you want to keep your volume constant. That way nothing is siphoned off through work related processes. It's an interesting, interesting twist, this problem. All right, let's see. Next guy is 73. All right, number 73, when 0.514 grams of biphenyl undergoes combustion in a bomb calorimeter, the temperature rises from 25.8 degrees Celsius to 29.4. 
by the change in energy for this for the combustion of biphenyl in kilojoules per mole, the heat capacity of the bomb calorimeter uh, determined in a separate experiment is 5.86 kilojoules per degree Celsius. All right, well, we are being tasked to find the ratio between kilojoules and moles. So we need first and foremost we need the thermal energy released second we need to know the moles of limiting reactant Um, Eric, I see your question uh, popping up there. I will get to it in uh, once I once I finish this problem. All right, so we know what we we're trying to find. We need to find our thermal energy um, released, and then our moles of limiting reactant. Take a ratio one to another. Let's look at what we're given in this problem. All right, so we are given the grams of our limiting reactant and we're given the chemical equation. So we can actually calculate our molecular weight, go from grams to moles, that'll be the bottom half. Next, we're given an initial temperature and a final temperature Um, initial temperature and final temperature. Ah, and we're also given the heat capacity of our bomb calorimeter, which is 5.86 kilojoules per degree Celsius. All right, so here's the thing. We want the Q for the reaction, which is the system. The bomb calorimeter is our surrounding, so we also need to remember that Q for our reaction, the system, is equal to negative one times the Q for the surroundings, which is, in this case, the bomb calorimeter. Q for the bomb calorimeter. So the cool thing about bomb calorimeters is you don't need to know their mass. They just have a um, heat capacity, not a specific heat capacity, but a heat capacity is equal to C times delta T. So calculating our change in temperature here, we have 29.4 degrees Celsius minus 25.8. So delta T is 3.6 degrees Celsius. So 5.86 kilojoules per degree C times 3.6. Change in thermal energy for our bomb calorimeter is 21.096 kilojoules because temperature cancels and we can only have two sig figs because that's our delta t 
I'm going to wait around to the end. All right, so we know... Um, We know our Q for the reaction now. So we just multiply this number by negative one. Next, we gotta find our moles. Point five one four grams of C12H 10 um, so this is a molecular mass of 154.20 grams C12H10 um, in one mole So let's crunch these numbers. This comes out to be point. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, bif biphenyl is the limiting reagent. All right, and now we're um, we're ready to crunch our numbers because we have our Q for our reaction. So we have 21.096 kilojoules. Only two sig figs there over um, Point zero zero three three three. It's actually three forever moles. All right, let's see. Uh, twenty one point zero nine six negative twenty one point zero nine six divided by point zero zero three 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 three. This is negative 63, let's see, the two sig figs, 6,300 kilojoules per mole. All right, so that is the answer for number 73. Um, okay, Eric, let me see. Random question, but what would you do in a redux equation for any time. Eric, quick question. Um, um, what are what what question do you mean when you say what would you do in a redox equation for two water molecules? Um, are you asking about like assigning the oxidation states or okay, 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 solid. Thank you. Now now I know exactly what you're asking. So so here's the deal. If you are assigning oxidation states, um and let's say you've got an equation where you've got um oops 
something like this going down. All right, so let's so so we're assigning oxidation states, and you've got to assign the oxidation states for water. All right, um, whenever you're assigning oxidation states, you ignore the stoichiometric coefficients and only look at the chemical formula. So you ignore the two out in front. You just look at H two O isolated, and then. Um, Rule number one can't help us yet. Um, rule number two says that hydrogen is always plus one when it is with other non-metals. It's minus one if it's the only non-metal present, but water's a non-metal, so hydrogen gets an oxidation state of plus one. And once you know the oxidation state of hydrogen, you can determine the oxidation state for oxygen because the oxidation state of our two hydrogens plus our oxygen equals our total charge, which is zero. So two times the oxidation state of hydrogen plus one plus oxygen is zero. So if oxygen plus two is zero, that means oxygen has an oxidation state of negative two. So that is how you assign the oxidation state um, for the elements of, in a water molecule um, in a chemical equation. It doesn't matter what it's reacting with, if it's reactant product. It doesn't even matter how many of them there are. You always ignore the quantity and just look at use the chemical formula to assign oxidation states. So you can actually assign... Um, excuse me. You can actually assign oxidation states um, even if your equation is unbalanced, which is kind of cool. every time. All right, marching on with these chapter six, um, Questions. Let's take a look at number 75. Our zinc metal reacts according to the balanced chemical equation. Okay, so they give us a balanced chemical equation. I'm going to start by writing this down. We've got solid zinc. Alright, so we've got solid zinc reacting with hydrochloric acid producing zinc 
chloride and hydrogen gas. There, now it is a um, balanced chemical equation. All right, so when 0.103 grams of zinc is combined with enough HCl to make 50 milliliters of a solution in a calorimeter, um, all of the, excuse me, all the zinc reacts, raising the temperature of the solution from 22.5 degrees Celsius to 23.7. Find the delta H for this reaction. And then they give us the density of the solution. Okay, let's, okay, so let's, let's write this out. Um, so we're told, um, let's see, that we have 0 0.103 grams of zinc plus 50 milliliter or plus Uh, you know what? Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna write this out in a different format. So, we are trying to find the delta H for this reaction. Now, change in enthalpy. is um, Q of the reaction over moles of limiting reactant. And that limiting reactant is going to be zinc. We know that because it is the only thing that we're given a mass of, a quantity of. So in this problem, we're assuming that there's enough other things to react with it. Let's go what we're given. So we have 0 0.103 grams of zinc. Um, we're told that we have 50.0 milliliters of solution. We're given T initial, 22.5 degrees C, we're given T final, 23.7 degrees Celsius. Um, we're also given the density of the solution. 1.0, right? Yeah, 1.0 grams per milliliter. And we're told the specific heat capacity for the solution is 4.18 joules per gram degrees C. Now, you'll notice that um, this is kind of feeling like Q equals MCAT, but we've been given a lot of stuff about the solution. And the reaction is a system. Q for the reaction is going to be equal to the Q of the solution times negative one. So that's the thing you've got to keep in mind um, with this. Now, our delta T for the solution, we can get from our initial and final temperature, right? We've got our specific heat capacity, but now for our mass, we're not giving it straight up 
but we are given the density and the volume. As you'll remember that density is equal to mass over volume. So, with our density and our volume, we can find our mass of solution. That'll allow us to calculate the heat capacity or the heat absorbed by the solution, which will tell us the heat released by the reaction. Ah! Kate, that is a great question. So the reaction, the actual chemicals interacting, reacting, are the system, is the system in this problem. And the solution, that thing that is holding the chemicals, those are the surroundings. So the energy released by the reaction is flowing into the system, and that's why the temperature of the solution rises. Um, so that is, uh, that is the situation that we're dealing with here. All right, so density is equal to mass over volume. If we multiply both sides by volume over density, density cancels on the left. Volume cancels on the right. We get an expression volume is equal to mass over density. Our mass was 50 point, whoops. 50.0 grams. Ah, yeah, yeah. And I, I just, Kate, it totally makes sense that you would think that. Um, but in this instance the solution is the chemicals and the solvent solute and solvents but the reaction itself that interaction between the molecules is the system that's releasing energy into the surroundings so 50 milliliters with two sig figs is our um, 50 milliliters with two sig figs is our volume. Um, I wrote it in scientific notation to show that it has two sig figs. Uh, let's see. There's our mass. Okay, so now we can calculate the energy absorbed by the solution because it's equal to MCAT, right? Oh, we need our, our change in temperature. Um, so let's get that delta T first. Oops. Change in temperature is final minus initial. Let's see, that was 23 point something. 23.7 minus 22.5. So that is a delta T of 1.2 degrees Celsius. Now we can calculate it. Wait, hang on. I'm trying to mess something up. Y yes, okay. I mean, 
it'll all come out the same. But let me let me just correct something really quick. We're given the volume and asked to find the mass. So I just messed up my algebra up here. Yes, totally. It, 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 it comes out to be 50 grams, so it'll be, it'll end up being okay. But let's correct this. Ah, no, it, it shouldn't be because um, they gave us the specific heat capacity, which you'll notice has joules. Whoops, I didn't mean to erase that. Thank goodness we got a, an undo. Joules per gram degree C. The only time you have um, C delta T is for calorimeters. But for um, solutions, um, for substances, it'll always be specific heat capacity so it'll be mass times specific heat capacity times change in temperature as opposed to just heat capacity times uh change in temperature all right let me correct that mass problem. so we've got density is equal to mass over volume multiply both sides here by volume All right, so mass is equal to density times volume. Um, right. So density times volume. So our density is 1.0 grams per liter or milliliter times 50.0 milliliters. Um, means that we'll deal, we'll still be dealing with 50, just 50 milliliters. Awesome. Okay. All right, let's, let's crunch some numbers here. Fifty times four point one eight times one point two. Two hundred fifty point eight um, joules. So that's the Q for our solution. Um, we know that the Q for a reaction. Oh, let's see. We can only keep two sig figs of this. Um, so we'll put those marks there by way of reminder. Um,
and our heat released by our reaction is negative 250. And still, we only have two sig figs here. All right. So we have our Q for our reaction. Um, we now need um, to calculate our moles for this reaction. And we do that with our mass for zinc. So we have point, is that 103 grams of zinc? And now I need to bust out a periodic table. So let's see, zinc, there it is. Sixty five point four one grams of zinc in one mole. So let's see, we got point one, oh wait, no, no, no. Oh yeah, point one zero three divided by 65.41. Hang on, that's not right. Point one zero three divided by 65.41. This comes out to be point zero zero one five seven. Four six eight. We can keep three sig figs. Alrighty, now we're ready to calculate our delta H because we have our negative two fifty point eight joules. Let's see, were we asked to do this in kilojoules? No, just to find the delta H of the reaction. So any unit goes. Our numerator is two sig figs over point zero zero one five seven four six eight. We've got three sig figs in our denominator. All right, so this is going to be a huge number if we leave it in joules, which is fine, we totally can. Um, 159270.175 joules per mole. We can keep two sig figs because of our numerator. Uh oh, and this is also a negative number. So our delta H is negative 160,000 joules per mole. Or, we weren't asked to do this, but if you convert it to kilojoules, it'll be negative 160 kilojoules per mole, and that just feels more manageable. All right, and that is... Number 75. All right, let's see. Number 76. I have a feeling this one will be similar. Let's see. 
Um, instant cold packs. Okay, yeah, this is a this is a thing. Instant cold packs used to ice ice uh, athlete athletic injuries on the field. Contain ammonium nitrate and water separated by a thin plastic divider. When the divider is broken, the ammonium nitrate dissolves according to huh, the endothermic reaction. Uh, this endothermic reaction. We take ammonium nitrate, H4NO3, solid. And uh, and it becomes aqueous. All right. Uh, in order to measure the enthalpy change for this reaction, um, we're told that um, one point two five grams of ammonium nitrate is dissolved in enough water. To make 25 milliliters of the solution. And we're it's the same, it's the exact same problem, actually. Kate, you're you're so totally welcome. So so we are given whoops. Hang on one second. There we go. Um, we are given an initial and a final temperature. Um, final temperature is 21.9 degrees C. Initial temperature is 25.8 degrees C. So our change in temperature, which is final minus initial, is 21.9 minus 25.8. So our change in temperature is negative 3.9 degrees Celsius. We have 25 milliliters of solution. Twenty-five point zero milliliters of solution, which we can multiply this by our density that they give us. We have 25 grams of solution, and they give us our specific heat capacity. This is so that we can all find the change in thermal energy for the solution. which will give us the change in thermal energy for the reaction. So negative 3.9 times 4.18 times 25. Change in energy for the solution is negative 407.55 joules. If we can keep two of these sig figs, that means Q for our reaction is a positive 407.55 joules. All right, now, um, We need to convert, so to find our delta H, we need to know how many moles we're dealing with. Um, so we're going to have to convert our mass of ammonium nitrate to, um, to moles. All right, so uh, we got to calculate that mass. 
nitrogen is 14.01, oxygen is 16.00, hydrogen is 1.008, and we have two nitrogens, three oxygens, four hydrogens. So our molecular mass will be 80.052. All right, so 1.25 divided by 80.052. Means that we're dealing with 0 0.0156 one four eight five moles of ammonium nitrate and as we see we can keep three sig figs and now we can calculate our delta H it's Q over moles so our change, 407.55 joules, two sig figs in the numerator, over 0.0156148, moles in the denominator, and there are three sig figs in the denom. Crunching our numbers, come out with 2sig uh, figs, so 26,000 joules per mole, or 26 kilojoules per mole. And that is the solution to number 76. All right, let's check out the next one. 78 part C. All right, consider the generic reaction. All right, so we're given a reaction where one mole of A reacts with two moles of B. And this produces one mole of C plus three moles of D. And the delta H here is 155. And they want to know, they want us to find Delta H for this reaction. One half mole of C reacts with three halves moles of D to produce a half mole of A and one mole of B. Well, the first thing we got to do here, so we want to know what this delta H is. One thing you'll notice is C and D are ah oh, 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 okay.
All right. So for solving this problem, the first thing I notice is the products for the given one are the reactants in the reaction we're being asked for. So my first move is going to be to flip my original reaction, which will give me C reacts with 3D, oops, not 3B, 3D to produce A and 2B. The delta H after the flip is going to have the same value, just opposite sign. <coughs> Excuse me. Next, I'll note I notice that all of my stoichiometric coefficients in my target reaction is one half of the stoichiometric coefficients in my given reaction. So I need to take everything here and multiply by one half. Once I do that, I have a half mole of C reacts with three halves moles of D to produce a half mole of A and one mole of B. And for this, we've got to cut our given delta H in half. So we take negative 155 divided by two. This comes out to be uh, negative 77.5 kilojoules per mole. And that is the delta H I was asked to find. All right, so let's see. So, oh, yeah, that was 78. Let's take a look at 83. Eighty-three. Okay, write an equation for the formation reaction of each compound um, from its elements in their standard form and find the delta H um, for each from appendix blah, 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 blah. All right, and this is ah, 83C. Okay, okay, and yes, Kate, this is where the answer to that question will come into play. So, uh, let's see, 83C. All right. Write an equation for the formation reaction. Okay, so for part C, they're asking us to write an equation for the formation of uh, iron three oxide. All right. Now, here's what you gotta remember. You gotta remember the definition of a formation reaction. It is the formation of one mole of product from its elements. All right, so you're only allowed to form one mole of product. Elements that form uh, iron three oxide are solid iron plus oxygen gas. Now, um, this equation as written is not balanced, right? This is, we've written out the elements that form iron three oxide. 
Um, but as it's written, it's not balanced. So let's take a look. We've got iron and oxygen. On the product side, we've got totally. It's based on that definition. You're only allowed to form one mole. And that's why we're forced to use fractions in this context. To balance iron, we multiply by two, and then we're good. Now, to balance oxygen, we have to multiply O2 by three halves. So now it's balanced, but because the definition of the formation reaction is you can only form one molar product, you got to leave the fraction in, in there. This is like one of the few times where it's actually okay to do that. Because I know when we're balancing normal reactions, it's you never leave a fraction. And, I, and I've harped on that. But based on the definition of a formation reaction, you gotta you gotta leave it at one mole. All right, let's see. So that was eighty three. C, let's take a look at 84. Write an equation for the formation of each. Oh, wait. Similar. Wait, let's see. 84, okay. So let's take a look, 84. So we're gonna write an equation for the formation reaction of each compound. Um, and so, okay, yep. So first one, formation of nitrogen dioxide gas. This is formed from the reaction of nitrogen gas and oxygen gas. Um, we got to multiply N2 by one half to balance it. And we have to leave it as one half because we can only form one molar product um, based on the definition of a formation reaction. All right, that's a, a. For B, we're forming um, magnesium carbonate. Um, we are going to uh, react to this with elemental ma or elemental magnesium plus carbon plus oxygen gas. That's O2 gas, solid carbon. It does feel weird, and and the fact that um it feels unnatural to you is a good sign because because it's not something that we should normally do. Um, but we have to do in this uh, very specified instance. One thing that can make it feel easier is don't think of it as half of a molecule. Think of it as half of a mole. You can have half a mole of nitrogen and it's, and it's no problem. Um, so that hopefully that might help it feel less uh, wrong. Like this is three halves moles of oxygen. Totally an allowed thing. Um, and it helps us adhere to the actual definition of a formation reaction. Writing out the formation of C2H4. Let's see, is that a gas? Yeah, that's a gas. Ethylene gas. It's going to come from solid carbon and hydrogen gas. We need two moles of hydrogen gas and two moles of solid carbon to make one mole of solid ethylene. Finally, if we're gonna form one mole of methanol, this is gonna come from a reaction, uh, the reaction of solid carbon with hydrogen gas 
and oxygen gas. One half um, times O2, because we only got one oxygen on the other side. Whoa, hold on, there's no two there. Um, we needed two times our hydrogen. So there we go. Those are all the formation reactions for 84. Let's take a look at 87. Oh, 87 D. All right, let's take a look. 87 D. Use the standard enthalpies of formation to calculate the delta H for each reaction. Okay, and so the uh, the reaction in question, problem 87, part D, is the reaction between chromium-3 oxide. Oops and carbon monoxide gas. These react to produce a solid chromium plus carbon dioxide. Kate, I totally recommend uh, getting more reps in. And, and yeah, and trying on your own, um, even getting stuck is a good thing because then through the process of getting unstuck, it actually will reinforce how to do the problem in your mind. So totally, I would totally invest some time getting more reps in with this stuff if you're feeling uh, shaky. All right, now the thing to remember when you're using change in enthalpy of formation reactions, that um, change in enthalpy for the reaction um, is equal to the sum, it's always final minus initial, right? The sum of all the delta H of formations of the products minus initial, right? The sum of all the delta H of formations for the reactants. So in other words, it's going to equal our products, which we've got the delta H of formation for CO2. And we're gonna multiply this by three because the Definition for delta H of formation is the formation of one mole. We make three moles in this reaction. Plus delta H of formation for chromium. We've got two here. Ah, oh, Kate, great question. And we'll get there. All right, so then we take these two and then minus standard enthalpy of formation for chromium three oxide plus delta H of formation for carbon monoxide. All right, so let me pull these up.
Okay. So, um... All right, let's look. So, um... So this is going to be three times our delta H information for carbon monoxide. Negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole. Um, this one's zero because chromium is an element. Right, those are just chromium atoms. Now we've got minus. Delta H information for chromium-3 oxide. I just had it. It's huge and negative. Negative 1134.70 kilojoules per mole. Plus 3 times carbon monoxide which is negative 110.5 alright so Kate here's the thing to remember um, about the stoichiometric coefficients um, those are exact numbers so for example if you're to take this This guy right here is exact. So 3 times 393.5 is the same as adding these dudes all up. So you've got to have the same precision. So this would be negative 1180.5 because that three is exactly three of them. So it's the same as adding them all together. And then we've got the 110.5 times 3. All right, and now we're ready to crunch our numbers. Yes. Um, and Rin, I see your question. I'll get to it once I uh, finish this problem. Almost done here. Uh, 1180.5. Oh, that's a negative number. Plus 1134.7 plus 331.5. I'm just going to double check my numbers. 1180.5. That's negative 1180.5. Plus 1134.7 plus... 331.5. Okay, sorry, the numbers were different two different times, so. I'm going to double check again. There we go. Okay, yes. 285. Point seven kilojoules per mole is our delta H.
All right, so that is the answer. Okay, Rin, let's see. Is there a specific order for listing the molecules in the sum? Oh, Rin, great question. Um, and the answer is uh, there is no um, correct order as long as you are adding the products and subtracting There's no particular order. As long as you're adding the products and subtracting the reactants, you're golden. Okay. Let's, okay, so that was 87. 87D, all right, let's check out number 92. Let's, uh, let's read the problem. 92, the explosive nitroglycerin, um, whose chemical formula is C3H5N3O9, decomposes rapidly upon ignition or sudden impact, according to the balanced chemical equation. Right, and that thing is huge. Um, Jason, uh, it, uh, honestly, oh, wait, wait, question, um, Um, delta H, the delta H of formation values will be given for those problems. Okay, let's see. Calculate the standard enthalpy of formation. <laughs> okay, sorry. This this problem. Um, this problem is just a pain in the butt. All right, this problem is just a royal pain. Okay. Do you want to see how to do this? We're being asked to find the delta H of formation for nitroglycerin, which is C3 H5 N3 O9. The formation is three moles of solid carbon plus, uh, let's see, H2 gas, five halves plus three halves of N2 gas plus nine halves of O2 gas. All right. 
Oh, man. This is a monster problem to be tackling at the end of the day. Hmm. But this is what office hours are for, right? So, we we want to find this Delta H. And let's look at what we're given. We are given... That we have... This is a Hess's Law problem, by the way. We are going to have to manipulate... Our, this reaction Oops. Um, into let's see we're going to have to manipulate this equation um, with the help of some other equations, add them all together, and that's how we're going to find the delta H of formation. And this delta H is negative 5,678. Okay, so first thing, we're going to have to do a flip, because nitroglycerin is on the product side. So when we flip this thing, we get This is going to be so many steps, by the way. Just hang in there with me. Hang on, I'm missing something. Yes, I am. This is a six. There's a six right there. Okay, that's all I was missing. produces four moles of nitroglycerin. Um, and after the flip, delta H here is a positive 56.78 kilojoules per mole. Now, we have a second problem. We only want to produce one mole so we need to multiply everything here by one quarter. That'll result in, let's see, 12 divided by four is three, three moles of CO2 gas plus five halves of H2O gas plus three halves of N2 gas plus one-fourth a mole of O2 gas producing one mole of nitroglycerin. And our delta H here has been cut to a quarter, so 5678 divided by 4 is, I'm going to wait to round to the end, but 14, 19.5 kilojoules per mole. All right. rewrite this I'm gonna rewrite this one that I wrote 
right down there on the bottom. Um, and we're going to compare it to what we have right now. So that's three moles of CO2 gas plus five halves moles of water plus three halves moles of nitrogen plus one quarter mole of oxygen gas produces one mole of nitroglycerin. And this delta H is 14, 19.5 kilojoules per mole. All right, now here's the deal. I want to compare this to what we have in place. This is looking good, right? One mole of nitroglycerin. You know what else is looking good? Three halves a mole, three quart, three halves moles of nitrogen gas. That also should be there. We've got three problem children. We have CO2 where there shouldn't be any CO2. We've got H2O where there shouldn't be any H2O. And we don't have the right amount of oxygen. Let's save oxygen for the end. All right. Now you be you may be wondering, well they don't give us anything else. How are we supposed to solve this? The answer is through change delta H of formation reactions. Check this out. The formation reaction for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide comes from carbon, which is a solid, and O2 gas. This reaction has a delta H of, let's look it up, negative 393.5. Kilojoules per mole. Now notice, we want to get rid of CO2. So we want CO2 to be on the product side of a reaction that will add to this so they'll cancel. But we only have one mole and here we're dealing with three. So we're going to multiply everything in this reaction by three. So we get three moles of, whoops. Sorry, I want that in black. So that we get three moles of solid carbon plus three moles of oxygen gas producing three moles of CO2 and our new delta H will be 393.5 times three. It's negative. 1180.5 kilojoules per mole. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take this reaction and we're going to add it To this reaction. Which this is When you add these two together, you'll notice that CO2 
cancels CO2. And what's our new reaction? It is three moles of solid carbon plus five halves moles of water plus three halves moles of nitrogen. Plus, you'll notice we've got three moles of oxygen plus one quarter mole of oxygen. So um, common denominator, three times four is 12. So this will be plus 13 quarters moles of O2. Um, and this produces one mole of nitroglycerin. And our new delta H here is the sum of these, the delta H's of these two reactions. So we've got 14, 19.5 minus 1180.5 comes out to 239 kilojoules per mole. Now, let's compare these two reactions and let's see what's good. Well, what's good right now, we've got one mole of nitroglycerin. We've got the correct amount of nitrogen gas, the correct amount of solid carbon. We've still got an oxygen problem and we have a water problem, right? We have water where there shouldn't be any, but now we know how to deal with it. Oh, sorry. This isn't This should be gas. Um, so we need to do the same thing that we just did. We need to deal with water. We need to get rid of our water vapor. So we're going to put that on the product side. And we're going to add H2 and O2 because we're going to look up the formation reaction here. The delta H of formation reaction for water vapor is around here somewhere. There we go. It's negative 241.8, yeah, 0.8 kilojoules per mole. Now, we want to cancel five halves of these. So we need to multiply everything in this reaction by five halves. That'll give us um, five halves of H2 gas plus five fourths of O2 gas producing five halves of water. And our delta H here, we gotta multiply this 241.8 times five divided by two. So it'll be negative 604.5. kilojoules per mole. Now, we take this reaction.
and we add them together. Now water will cancel with water. What are we left with? Three moles of solid carbon plus five halves moles of hydrogen plus three halves moles of nitrogen plus, okay, let's see here. Um, 13 fourths plus five fourths. I don't trust my brain to do this. 13 plus five is 18. So 18 fourths, so that's nine halves. So what do you know it? What do you know? We have nine halves moles of oxygen, gas, all producing one mole of nitroglycerin. And this delta H will be the sum of 239 plus negative 604.5. After rounding for sig figs, it'll be negative 366 kilojoules per mole. And that is the delta H uh, formation for nitroglycerin. How is that for one intense problem? This would be my challenge to you. If you guys can do this problem, you can handle any Hess's Law problem I throw at you. Um, excuse me, I'm so sorry for yawning. Uh, on the exam, this is harder than anything I put on there. Kate, I appreciate you enriching office hours with all your excellent questions. Um, thank you so, so very much. Okay, Rin, let's see.
So, Rina, I'm trying to um, understand. Okay. 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 That 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 helps me out. So when you when you look at. the ideal gas law, and the equation for molecular weight. Molecular weight is grams per mole. If you multiply both sides of this equation by moles over molecular weight, you get molecular weight canceling, moles canceling, and you get a new equation, moles are equal to the mass divided by molecular weight. Which we can then plug into the ideal gas law. So we get PV equals grams over molecular weight times RT. Then when you multiply this equation, let me give myself a little more space here. If you multiply both sides by molecular weight over PT, oh sorry, not PT, PV. Pressure and volume cancel on the left, molecular weight cancels on the right, and you get an equation that says molecular weight is equal to, of a gas, is equal to the mass of that gas in grams times R times T over PV. Um, and then if you take this expression, I'm just going to rewrite it over here. So the molecular weight of a gas is equal to the grams, mass in grams times R times temperature over pressure times volume. Um, if you look at the units, so, so let's look at the units at play. You're going to have oops, grams times. Now, the units for R are liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Temperature units equal Kelvin. Pressure unit has got to be atmospheres. Volume unit. It's got to be liters. Now, when you look at what cancels, atmospheres in the denominator cancels atmospheres in the numerator. Kelvin cancels with Kelvin. And then liters cancel with liters. So what are we left with? The only unit left after you punch everything into this equation should be grams over moles. If you are getting different units, go back and double check. Make sure that um, you plug in all your units. If the units you get out of this equation are not grams per mole, if there's something else that doesn't cancel, um, it means that somewhere along the line um, you missed a unit conversion. Maybe you were given a unit, for example, in um, tor or millimeters of mercury and... Uh, and, and you didn't convert them, and so, so maybe atmospheres didn't cancel out or something like that. I would go back um, and check. If you got, like, if your answer's spot on, then my guess is you probably didn't write out your units correctly, and that's why it's looking like atmospheres is left over. But if your value's correct, then my guess is your unit's probably grams per mole. There was just some slip-up 
um, in canceling somewhere. Let's see. Okay. Rin, let me double check the worksheet. That sounds like a typo. If you got grams for mole, then you are rock solid. Um, let me take a look. So check this out. Um, AMU uh, and grams per mole are the same unit. So one gram per mole is one AMU. So then, then you're actually totally fine. You haven't missed anything. They're just different uh, symbols for the same unit. Oh yeah, dude, totally no worries. It happens to the best of us. <laughs> Dude, that would totally be confusing, though. I'm glad we were able to, uh, to sort it out.
Okay, let's see. And a question from earlier with us is problem number 92. The formation reaction was applied. I was wondering. Ah, okay. Let me, okay. Let me pull up that problem just so I have the context. Let me see if I remember. Oh, hang on. I think that was the nitroglycerin problem. Almost there. Okay, so that was the nitroglycerin uh, problem. Written great um, question. So, so basically, how I knew that we would need to use the um, formation reactions is in the equation that they gave us, which I believe is... So we're trying to find this one. All right, um, so they gave us this problem right here. All right, so this was the given problem or the given equation. And after a couple of manipulations, we got it so that there's only one mole of nitroglycerin on the product side, which is what you need for a formation reaction, because the definition of a formation reaction is you form one mole of product from uh, all of the elements used to make it, not molecules, but elements. So we manipulated that given equation to a place so that only one mole of that product was being formed. However, we had a couple of problems. One, we had water on the reactant side. Two, we had carbon dioxide on the reactant side. And for both of these, um, we need, we needed to cancel. And the way you cancel is you have to have, if you wanted to cancel water, you have to have water on the product side because this water's on the reactant side. So the way you cancel is by adding, oops. So I knew we needed to add the formation reactions because they would cancel the molecules and leave behind in their place just elements. Now, so that's, that's how I knew to approach it that way. Um, because we can look at the formation reaction delta H's right in the book. We have access to that. Um, and so that would be a way of removing the molecules and replacing them with just the individual elements. Now, this, um, the difficulty level of this problem exceeds what I would put for a Hess's Law problem on the exam. Um, so you don't have to stress about facing a problem that's going to be this hard uh, per se. The reason why I assign it as practice homework is if you can solve a problem this bad, then all the monsters you're going to run into on the exam are going to seem like small, uh, small potatoes. But that's how I knew to use the delta H of formation because I knew we needed to cancel those molecules and replace them with their elements.
Ah. Uh, honestly, um, Rin, great question. Honestly, it. Uh, so, so to be. <laughs> I was said. Oh my gosh, sorry. Um, it's like, I. I was switching from saying totally to saying perfectly, and it started coming out as turdly or perfectly. I don't know. It sounded like a turd. Anyway, sorry about that. So, to be totally honest, um, this is the first time I've ever seen uh, a problem that required you to use the Delta HF formations in a Hess's Law application. So, I've actually never seen a problem like this before, um, other than this one, which obviously I picked out and assigned. Um, but it's been a while. Uh, it's been a few years since anybody's asked me about this specific question. So, so it, it felt like a new problem to me. Um, I have not designed any problems on the exam where you'll need to pull a Delta H of formation, um, number, but then use that, um, equation in a Hess's law application. All of the Hess's law problems um, I, I give that stuff to you and then you, you use what I give you to manipulate it around and find the Delta H for the chemical reaction um, in question. So yeah, so it's this isn't even like a thing that you have to be like thinking like, oh, it's going to show up somewhere or I should watch out for this. Um this specific application is unique only uh, to this problem. I could in the future use uh, use this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But um, but to be honest, I've already written the exam, so I'm definitely not going to add it in now.
Alrighty, and that is going to do it for tonight. Thanks everybody for uh, coming out, making it an awesome office hours. Uh, we covered a lot of ground, a lot of great prep for the upcoming exam. Um, I hope you found it helpful. I will catch you all on, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Wednesday. Have an awesome night.